You can call me Yao Man. Uh, I have been at Tyndale for 17 years, and uh, it's been just a marvelous experience to be able to walk with our students on their journey of spiritual formation and vocational discernment. Prior to this, I taught for six years at Singapore Bible College, so in all about 23 to 25 years. Eric Erickson, as a developmental theorist, is just uh, an astounding person that has impacted the field of uh, practical theology. So in seminary, when we talk about practical theology, it is how to do ministries in the church. Of all the developmental theories that has impacted the field of practical theology, Eric Erickson is the most well-known of all the developmental theories. In fact, someone said that in youth ministry, and I would say in children ministry, Eric Erickson is more well-known than any theologian. So it is very, very important that you understand him. I first encountered Eric Erickson, uh, in theory, not in person, when I was in my doctoral work in Chicago. And, ever, and my children at the time were young. And so as I was listening to my, my doctoral mentor talk about Eric Erickson, I was testing some of the theories at home, right? And even in church, I volunteered myself for three months teaching Sunday school in Chicago. And uh, wow, it's changed the way I view children and youth. I'll be reviewing uh, their development, stages of development, in the way uh, they uh, relate to themselves emotionally and in the way they relate to others socially. So psychosocial development is how people grow in the way they understand themselves, their identity, and relate to others. Now, Erickson has quite a complex history, actually, uh, from, uh, from a Jewish background, both mother and father. Um, but when uh, he was conceived, uh, their parents were in a difficult relationship. And just before he was born, his father already left the family. So this was really tough. His mother, uh, Carla, went to Germany to give birth, perhaps to forget the sad experiences that she has had. And there she uh, trained as a nurse and single-handedly brought Erickson up uh, as a dedicated mother. When Erickson fell ill, he, she would regularly go to consult the pediatrician there. And soon there was a relationship between her and her pediatrician. And he married her. And he, and that's why the H is the Homburger, Erickson adopted his adopted father's middle name, Homburger. Uh, and uh, he was really very loving to Eric as an adopted son. He supported him in all his travels. But from very young, because of this complex history, Erickson has always struggled with his identity. He was Jewish, uh, so features, uh, looks and so on, and hair colour, so different from the Danes uh, in his contemporary Danes at school. He also struggled with why his father left him. Issues of, uh, you know, separation, of uh, coming together, issues of identity. Uh, who is he? A Jew, and yet not fully uh, recognised by the community around him. So national identity, religion, ethnicity, sense of self has always been his question from the very beginning. Erickson was not the typical school guy. Uh, he loved drawing. Uh, he, he was very brilliant, you will see afterwards. But he didn't sort of flourish in school, that in the, in the, in the uh, cognitive sense. He was not school smart, but he was very smart as a person. So after high school, and at that time in Germany, the high school qualification uh, was a, a very competent degree, a diploma, the high school diploma. After that, he took time off from his school, a moratorium, so to speak, and he traveled around in Europe. It was when he was in Vienna that he met this person who started a special school for children of affluent parents who were not adapting well in the normal education system in Vienna, Birmingham. And Erickson taught art there. In fact, he was so gifted in, in drawing, he drew the portraits of these various students. Of course, you have to be very rich to come to a special school. He got to know these children, their parents, and he met Anna Freud. 
Anna Freud is the daughter of Sigmund Freud, a very well-known uh, psychoanalyst at the time. And Anna Freud saw in Ericsson not only his gift in working with children, in teaching art and so on, he eventually got a diploma in Montessori, and he invited Ericsson to join her in her Institute of Psychoanalysis. To the gain of developmental psychology, Ericsson went there and flourished under the tutorship of Anna Freud. So his only qualification academically was his diploma from this institute. Nothing else. He didn't go to university. He bas basically learned through experience and of course under a very well-known set of mentors, Sigmund and Anna Freud, particularly Anna, because he was passing over to his daughter, the mentor of leadership. Interestingly, uh, Erickson married a Canadian, Joan Susan, and she went to Bernard College uh, in the Manhattan area for ladies, a very famous school. And uh, then, they, as they were being trained at that time in uh, 1933, the Nazis' uh, movement was getting more uh, popular in certain parts of Europe, and they were going into Austria. They felt the threat, and so they left United States to Boston. It was in Boston that he set up his first child psychoanalysis clinic. The first one ever. He would talk to the children, met with the parents and talk about the way they develop and their psychosis. Look at uh, his appointments academically. Even though he did not have a degree, he was employed as part of the faculty at Harvard, at UC, uh, Harvard Medical School. That tells you something about his brilliance, actually. Working in a second language, able to uh, relate uh, what he was doing with the public in a significant way. His major publication came in 1950, Childhood and Society. And there, in that book, there was one chapter which is entitled The Eight Ages of Man or Humanity. Eight Ages of Humanity. And there, it details how a person, as he or she grows up, goes through a series of what he calls crisis, C-R-I-S-I-S, -I -I series crises, S-E-S, plural. A crisis is a conflict of psychological states, conflicting psychological states that seek dominance within a person. Afterwards, I will show you some examples of this. And in order for the person to grow a sense of a healthy sense of self, there must be a healthy resolution of these conflicting psychological states. So a crisis needed to be resolved. And over the course of one's life, it is this sense of resolution and mastery at certain stages of the sense of self that lead to a healthy uh, development of the person. I say it. All good research work stands on the shoulder of other researchers, always. That's why in academic work, we always have a literature review. What other people have found and written? So Erickson's work, of course, was built on Sigmund Freud. And Freud at the time, as he went through psychoanalysis of his patients who came to see him, Freud found that always these people identified certain significant events in their childhood that did not resolve, that came back to haunt them as adults. And so he said, children, the first six years of their life, very, very crucial. If they are not helped to go through healthy experiences, it can affect them emotionally, developmentally, psychologically. So the uh, quotation from Wordsworth is right. The child is the father of the man. And at that time, actually, this theory that the first six years of a child's life is crucial was not well accepted in contemporary society at that time. In fact, they think that children, all you have to do is to provide food and shelter for them. They are fairly mindless to about six, seven years old. But Freud said, no, it is essential for them to be able to develop a sense, a healthy sense of self. 
for his theory, uh, Freud was actually ostracized. We know about that because Anna Freud would give lectures about his father's experiences when he brought up this theory among his fellow uh, psych psychiatrists in the academy. But Erickson felt that Freud's theory was too narrow. To limit a person's growth to the fixed first six years of life is just too, too, not enough. A person continues to grow over life. So he began to change and think about the theory, how it can, it in fact goes further. Freud is helpful, but there are other parts that are unexamined that he wanted to explore. And that was really amazing. He also felt that if there has been crises that were not resolved in a healthy way, an adult can actually come back to revisit and to try to learn how to reorganize that experience and think about it in a new way and seek healing and recovery. So, a little overview of Erickson's theory. The first is that it is based on what we call epigenetic principle. That is, Within every human person is a ground plan of personality development, epigenetic, from the genes. However, while it is there, the potentials are there, the environment in which one grows up in is critical because it affects the full flowering or maturing or not of those particular characteristics. Epigenetic, very important. Second principle. Sometimes Erickson's theory is also known as biopsychosocial. What do you mean? Bio in the sense that we are all born biologically with certain number of traits. We came from certain experiences and these affect who we are in a certain way. Then as this who we are with our particular traits are worked out in a particular social context, we gain an emerging sense of self and an understanding of one's gift. So the bio and the psycho, a sense of self. Then, as the opportunities begin to open within the context in order for the person to work out one's gifts and responsibilities, to honour peers, demands of the institution, demands of family and friends, then one begins to understand a sense of one's self, biopsychosocial, worked out within the community. Again, reiterating the fact that the ground plan needs to be worked out in the context of a group of people. Lastly, as what I have said, personality development goes through distinct stages, each with a crisis of opposing psychological states that need to be resolved. And there are eight stages. So what are these eight stages? I will cover up to stage number five, identity versus role diffusion. Each one, uh, the basic trust and mistrust are the opposing psychological states and the resolution uh, will come out in some form or other. That must be healthy. Otherwise, it will affect the person's psychosocial development. Let's go to the, each of these stages and I'm going to draw on implications for ministry. Always, uh, his theory is built on Freud's work, so other than the fact that I point to it, I will not explain because of time. From very young, the child begins to understand his or her environment by way of feeling and sensing through feeding, through sucking, even the biting for those who are breastfeeding, who I know this occurrence among children, is a sense of the child understanding one's environment. It is this later incorporation of one's surroundings and realities begin to extend from the mouth to the hands, to the eyes. The child, from very young, is already learning about one's environment. Do not think that the child is so passive. Forming schemes and understandings and connections with whoever is there. It is very crucial, according to Erickson, that at this stage, that there is a consistency of support in the interaction between the child and the caregivers and the people around him or her. Very important. If the child is hungry, then that's met. If the child has soiled his or her nappy, that is met. It's very, very important. Our basic needs met consistently and on time. 
If so, trust will develop. If not, then mistrust. Actually, mistrust is not in a sense unhealthy because it is learning to trust in a discerning way, in a wise way. That's why it is always a trust and mistrust. But when mistrust overrides the trust, then there is an unhealthy sense of self. Now, according to Erickson, trust is when there is an ease of feeling, depth of sleep, and relaxation of bowels. It's very interesting how it relates to the, the physical as well. And it has been found that children who have not resolved this well tend to be less cooperative. That means having more mistrust, more aggressive, less willing to explore, and frightened. Now, is there clinical support for Erickson's work? Harry Harlow is, uh, brought Rene Spitz is very important uh, in his work. He looked at uh, two groups of children from birth to several years. He followed a group of orphans and a group of children in prison. But the children in the prison were able to have exposure to their parents, particularly mums at this time, who were able to interact with them periodically, whereas the orphans did not have parental interaction because they didn't know who they were. At four months, development was measured, and it was about the same. At one year, motor intellectual performance were higher in the children in the prison nursery mm -hmm. compared to children in the orphanage. Children in the orphanage were less playful, less curious, more subject to infections. What's the conclusion? Anyone? What do you think? Why in the orphanage, children are well cared for, fed, uh, slept, uh, clothed, have safety. Compared to the children in nursery, in the prison, the children develop more healthy and faster. In the prison, why? Connecting with their mom, interacting, playing, experiencing that sense of love. Very, very crucial. Speed's experiment was very important. At two to three years old, these psychological measurements right, were even more distinct and apparent as time progressed. So sensory and social interaction is very, very important to build this sense of trust. Another clinical support comes from Harry Harlow. <laughs> we probably look at these experiments with frowns today. How can you keep monkeys in, in the, in the exper experimental environment and do things with them? But Harry Harlow was at that time where uh, experiments with animals were quite free. So what he did was he has uh, this group of monkeys that were exposed to different environments. And you see uh, they were all uh, exposed to either a cloth surrogate mother or a coal iron surrogate mother. And he found that the monkeys, the little monkeys, would always run to the surrogate, uh, the coal iron surrogates for bottle feeding, and they leave a bottle there, and would not stay there. After feeding, immediately go to the cloth mother to hug because of the warmth. Over a period of time, 70 to 80% of the young monkey would spend hugging the warm cloth mother, not just for feeding feeding only when there was a need. You can go to Euclid and uh, type Harry Harlow Monkey and you'll find him speaking and uh, some of these experiments are very fascinating. So trust versus mistrust. The resolution is toward hope. Hope is the, the sense of confidence that as the child moves towards the future, even though it's uncertain, there is a sense of you know, hopefulness a sense of confidence that is there. The key event is feeding. I can depend on you. Trust versus mistrust. The second is autonomy versus shaming. As the child grows older, the sphincter muscles uh, and general muscles begin to mature because the child becomes more uh, mobile. So the hands begin to grab and begin to, in fact, throw things down on the floor. Sam, what are you doing? You are dirtying the floor. And Sam would like to do that, right? And the, the cat or the dog would come and pick up food. That's 
the child's way of learning as well through now increasingly more mobile ways of understanding the world. Uh, Sam will begin to either come close to you or push away from you. A sense of independence is becoming to be more apparent. And bowel, the sphincter muscles, particularly bowel, you know, when, to, when to go, when to control, is beginning to be developed in the child. So this sense of self-confidence is increasing at one and a half to about three years old. You know about the terrible twos? No, mine, no, um, mine, I, and the child would just focus on this. Not that they are, you know, stubborn, a developing sense of self is beginning to form. Can we have some uh, air, please? Uh, getting a bit, uh, I particularly, getting a bit warm. So, at this time, not to overprotect the children, but to encourage their motor and cognitive skills. If you do not allow them to be autonomous, to explore, to understand their surrounding and their world, they will develop a sense of shame. So, Ericsson, however, this point to the fact that as children grow up in the environment, they need to understand that not every adult is at their back and call. Everyone has their individual programs and there's a social expectations to need to be recognised. Social conventions of doing things. So toddlers will need to learn that there are other people's schedules. But the will, the development of the autonomy, the sense of will, sense of self is very important. According to Erickson, will is the unbroken determination and exercise of free choice as well as restraint. So it's not just nothing. No, no barriers, it's also some restraint, society's expectations and other people's schedule. So it is very important for us when we minister to children at this time to provide a safe environment, not to overprotect them and prevent them from going into things. That's the way they, they learn, they explore. If there are breakables around the room, put them up. That's important. Otherwise, they will be fearful to explore. Of course, we will teach them about the importance of not hurting themselves. But other than this, give them that opportunity to develop that sense of will, self. Also, it is critical that you teach them rather than overcorrect them. For example, when you have uh, uh, reading stories to them, um, you, you help them to go into the stories uh, to the creative, imaginative part. Why did he do that? Why did she not follow her dad? Uh, what do you think? Rather than correcting the person's pronunciation and, and the right uh, way to do things, otherwise it will create a sense of shame. So overcorrection in when we are talking about language can result in stuttering of little children. So that is important. So healthy reading, uh, Practices would be questions, imagination, discovery. So, stage two, autonomy versus shame. Development, a sense of a will towards a sense of self. Otherwise, shame will develop. Autonomy versus shame. The healthy resolution is a sense of will. The key phrase is, what is this? Children are into everything at this time. What's this, mommy? You know, what's this? putting things here and there. Some children even put little beads into their nose. Yeah. So, implications for ministry. I always remind my students, when you are in nursery, uh, tell the parents as well, it is not a time to catch up on what happened in the week. Children are learning from us. Nursery is a place of ministry. We need to meet their physical, emotional and spiritual needs. The, the nursery should be a, a wonderful place for children to feel safe, to explore, right? Familiar faces are important because that will provide a sense of calmness, uh, reliability. So get your parents, tell them about it. Let them to, get them to volunteer regularly in, in this ministry. Uh, then certain no loud noises, arguments can create agitation among the children. So a little soft music in the background is very important. No loud talking. Of course, 
Children are into every place. Clean environment, comfortable environment is very important. Soft toys, wood puzzles, activity centres and so on are very important. A sink, diapers available, a change table, uh, and uh, no shoes so that children can be free to explore around. Those are very important. Now, toddlers at two years old, some of them prefer to play by themselves and uh, they may find uh, that sharing is difficult for them because they are so egocentric. They look at the world from their point of view uh, and they can be very temperamental. So you need to guide them gently as they move from the sense of self-centeredness to other-centeredness. I go to churches a lot to uh, nurture Sunday school teachers and I visit churches a lot. I love to see how they arrange their nursery and their Sunday school rooms. So, uh, what do you see here? Can you tell me? What are some of the things you see? Okay. Toys, lots of it, colourful ones. Toys that they can manipulate. Yeah? Sorry? Eye level, for sure, yeah. Um, yeah. According to Ericsson, this male child has to learn she is not his woman and there can be a rivalry of some kind. But here, at this stage, children learn to take initiative. That's why I, I love this photo. I, I take my students in human development and learning to the local school to observe, actually. I took this from, with the permission of the teacher, uh, to one of the schools. This is show and tell. Show and tell. You bring something, every child has a, a turn, and it's a secret thing. And the person who is in the front will be asking, what do you think I have? And the children will say, is it furry? Does it make noise? <laughs> uh, does it move? You know, is it a plant? No. This is great because the child has the opportunity to take control. Uh, initiative. And it is this initiative, this sense of purpose in planning towards solving that problem that intrigues Ericsson. Purpose, purpose in tackling task. So at this time, children love to do things for themselves. You know, I remember when I was young and helping my daughter with uh, getting her coat on. I do it myself, Daddy. I do it myself. You know, uh, let me tie your shoes. I do it myself. We are late. You know, surely we are late. I do it myself. You know, no argument. You have to. It's a sense of initiative that is so strong. Then they're developing a sense of social boundaries, what they can do, what they cannot do. So yeah, uh, helping them to understand this is important as they take initiative. At the same time, what kind of person are they growing up to be? An awareness of their gender and identity. Now, girls tend to uh, be aware of their feminine nature and you'll find girls at this time sometimes getting into mummy's cosmetic set and do their makeup yes. and suddenly put on mummy's shoes and walking in high heels, you know? <laughs> and when you see some of the girls, they're playing with their dollies, they will talk to them like mummy talked to her. And then the boys, they love to take the father figure. They love to do things that do. And especially, they like to be the protector of the house when dad is not there. You try to play pillow fight or water fight in the family, the sons will always protect mummy, you know, protect sister. They are the ones who stand up. They take the, the male role. Erickson is very particular that we should observe the play uh, of children at this time as they are learning initiative. Play. Because play is a hybrid between fantasy and real. So playing fireman, for example, playing a nurse, playing a teacher is a hybrid world. It's an opportunity for them to work out their, their persons, their responsibilities. It's very important. Initiative versus skill, the resolution is toward a sense of purpose. The key event is independence and the key phrase, I can do it myself. Children at this time love to help you and give them that wonderful opportunity. So eager to please, eager to, to uh, give you a hand. Provide freedom within safe limits, uh, as I said before. Provide expectations, repeat expectations regularly. 
praise more than punish at this time. Provide a safe and secure learning environment, routine, as what has been uh, mentioned uh, in previous workshops. Uh, very important. Basic rules, expectations, be consistent, very important. And then they're developing social skills. So they're having friends, one or two friends that they play with more regularly at this time. Uh, so have friends over as well. Provide guidelines for them. Uh, repeat, use positive reinforcement, very important. So they are learning self-control as well. Uh, as I said, they are moving, uh, children are very egocentric. They look at the world from their own perspective. They are not able to see it from another person's perspective. But they are moving towards that social world. You need to help them to navigate uh, that change. Uh, so, sharing things may not be easy. Taking turns may not be easy. You need to remind them. You know, that's very important because they are moving towards that. Stage four, mastery versus inferiority. Here, Freud re refers to this as a latency period because there are latent things that need to be developed in the child. And it is not surprising that in many uh, cultures, school begins around this time, five to six years old. The attention turns out. You know, when the child begins to go to school, uh, the Concern of the parent is, will my child be able to get up in time, get dressed, meet the bus, you know, will be able to line up to find the right class, will the child be able to work with others, how will the child be relating to the teacher? Myriad of questions that parents are concerned about and the child is concerned too because this is a time when the child learns to cope, to understand, to know, to learn the system. But there is that inborn imprint to master, mastery, to try and to learn new things. According to Erickson, children at this age are imbibed with the ethos of production. By the way, I love Erickson. He's very artistic with his definitions. The ethos of production. Even his resolution statements are so beautiful. So mastery versus inferiority to it, competence. The resolution is to be able to manage and function in an emergingly, increasingly complex world. The key event is school, and the key phrase is, can I try? Implications. Friends at this time are very important, uh, so they, they spend a lot of hours together in school. Um, so learning always is learning to work with others, to be cooperative with others, to learn in group together, when you are in Sunday school and you don't have this kind of collaborative group work, it doesn't go well with them. A sense of industry, they learn to master things. So this is a time where you provide questions for them about the story, give them puzzles. They love to solve puzzles and get it right because their sense of mastery. Memorizing a Bible verses can be more emphasized at this time because they want to get it right. They want to know. They want to know the story of the Bible. Failure to keep up with peers is a, a cause of concern for children at this stage. Uh, they are worried. How will, how will they be viewed? Uh, they, are they are desirous to please, but what if it doesn't work out? Determined to be accurate? Well, what if they get it wrong? So you need to help them to understand. It is okay. It is okay to learn, to make mistakes. No problem being late for school, not being light, meeting new people. Those are great challenges for every person, adults included actually. What more children? So we need to support them, to encourage them. Stop here for a while. Any, uh, okay, right, let's go on to junior years. Girls mature faster than boys at this stage, uh, beginning of adolescent uh, years for girls. But later on, the, the guys actually catch up. Beginning to have best friends, like to do things together, learn together, do trips together, so like to sit and chat together. Sleepovers are very important. And they love to discuss things, so have good movies together that they can watch, talk together, read good books together, learn by discovery. Lectures are boring. I'm glad we had a wonderful lecture by, uh, is it Annette? Annette today, marvellous. How to engage the body, the mind. Uh, and uh, body, mind, and uh, heart, is it? 
passion. Yeah. Um, they are at this time getting to understand who the heroes are. They are attached to certain heroes in the movie world and in the entertainment industry, in the sports industry. So what about heroes in the Bible that we can teach them about? Trust versus mistrust. Autonomy versus shame. Initiative versus guilt. Mastery versus inferiority. Every individual has seeds for a personality development. They are inborn within them. But you must create the environment to stimulate the full flowering of these functions so that there is a healthy resolution. The next segment I'm going to teach you uh, that Erickson talks about is very, very important. Someone said, you are not a real parent until you have been a parent of teenagers. <laughs> right. And it was Erickson who first coined the word identity crisis. It was him, identity crisis. So the adolescent is a very, very interesting world. It's a complex world because they are not children and they are not fully adults. They are in between. It's a very challenging time. It's also a time where they are maturing sexually and where they are maturing intellectually. And their common question is, who am I? Mm -hmm. Who am I? How do I fit identity crisis? So there are major shifts. Cognitively, they are into what we call abstract thinking. Abstract means they are able to distinguish between objective and subjective opinion. Oh, this is what you say, mom. I don't think it's like that. You don't know anything. You don't know anything. <laughs> When I completed my PhD studies, I was returning to Singapore to teach and I stopped over in London to spend some time with my sister who uh, was married and living there. And she told me, I do not know what's happened to my daughter. Overnight, she's become very rebellious. Overnight. You know, she was so good. This is a common phrase among parents. Overnight, they become rebellious. It's because they become more critical. Not in the negative sense, but in the healthy sense of trying to find truth for themselves, understand reality for themselves in a more empirical way. Not what you say, but how do I think it through? We call this abstract conceptualization. Second, they are going through physiological changes, hormonal changes. Their voice begins to change, their body begins to change, Sexual urges begin to change. So it's a very, very critical time. These great changes within the human body uh, of a teenager produces a lot of stress, a lot of stress. So they're always very self-conscious. Have you ever seen children, uh, teenagers walking by mirrors and say, you know, <laughs> always. They're, they're always thinking that someone is looking at them and criticizing them. And then, uh, according to David Alkine, who is a nanodevelopmental theorist who studied with uh, Jean Piaget, he says that there is a personal fable that adolescents, many adolescents hold to. That is, no one in this world understands how I feel. You don't know. You don't understand. And they spend a lot of time in the bathroom. Well, you know, <laughs> it's. 10 to 11, we need to go, or we'll be late for church, you know? Hello? Not ready, right? <laughs> Lots of time. And then physiologically, uh, because of this, so many changes, um, acne begin to appear, and that's very stressful for teenagers with acne. And, um, and hey, temperamental, unregulated emotions, unregulated. Sometimes very happy, sometimes very moody, and uh, you do not know. Like walking on eggshells. Because of so much changes within uh, adolescents at this time, they seek, to, they seek to be together and they find their security in a group of people. That's what it is. Friends are very important 
at this time. So if they want an advice, they normally do not come to you as parents, but they go to their peers. What, what, what do you think? You know, they go on Facebook, they go on social media, WeChat, and, 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 and uh, WhatsApp, and so on. Um, they ask their friends, and this hold true, whether it is teenagers in Seoul, or in Toronto, or in you know, Ethiopia, it's the same. That's, that's it. And then there are major triggers of insecurity. When they compare themselves with their peers and they have no sense of mastery in particular areas, they feel a low sense of self. When they do not fit in, when they don't have the right things that they understand to be, to be part of the group, you must have these things, or what the media says you should have, they will be insecure. Yet, adolescents desire a sense of coherence. They long for some stability. They want to be faithful to something. But the question is, fidelity to what? That's their question. What, what, what do they look for? According to Erickson, at this stage, adolescents are open to both, they are vulnerable, and it's also a period of great strength. Vulnerable in the sense that when they encounter certain peer groups and people with certain values that they want to hook onto to belong, they will go for it. So it's not surprising that youth gangs, pop culture at this time tend to attract the youth because of that communality, commonness together to holding to a set of values, right or wrong. So Ericsson was very conscious of this because the Nazi movement had a very strong emphasis among the youth at that time. And in fact, if you look at some movements uh, in modern history, the Arab Spring began with the youth, youth movement. The uh, communist, uh, communism in, Russia, in China, the youth movement was very, very important. In fact, in the church, in missions, youth were very important. One of the major starters of world mission was the youth. So, a period of strength, if you can capture that imagination with a sense of vision, a sense of vulnerability if you expose them to things that they will lock onto and not knowing for themselves. So, however, they, even though they, they have commitments, they, some youth tend not to be able to keep, to sustain pledge loyalties. So you need to help them, to remind them, and to encourage them. So Erickson says, identity versus role diffusion or role confusion. What is the resolution? Fidelity, some kind of faithfulness. Mm -hmm. The key event is relationships with peers, and how do other people see me? Now, these are the definitions of identity. Identity is, according to uh, Wolfgang et al., mobilizing personal drives, abilities, beliefs, history, and forming them into a cohesive picture of who they are, making decisions as to what kind of work they like to do, and commitments they like to keep. A sense of understanding of self with one's gifts, uh, and able to fit in to a certain place and a role. Confusion is not being able to fit in with so many options, not understanding who one is, a sense of self. Around the middle, adolescents with their ex rapidly expanding mental powers feel overwhelmed by the countless options and alternatives before them. Particularly in societies in the West where there are so many options, this sense of role confusion increases among the youth. In more structured kind of societies, including modern societies, more determined role uh, opportunities and expectations, there's less kind of confusion. Interesting. So for adolescent ministry, it is this. Identity is very important. And identity formation tends to be influenced by the people that they are with among the youth. According to Kendall Chrissy Dean, Professor of Youth Ministry at Princeton Theological Seminary. So 
if you are in children, preteens ministry, make sure you have a strong group community understanding. Then there are high ideals. I love this quotation from Kenda Cressy Dean. Adolescents are searching for something, for someone to die for, to use Erickson's, Erickson's haunting phrase. A cause worthy of their suffering, a love worthy of a lifetime. So beautiful. So, in ministry to preteens, to youth, make sure you have a great community, a safe space that they can call their own and they can hang out together and share together some of their hurts and feelings and struggles and especially work out their sense of identity. And for us, who are we? What does it mean to be fearfully and wonderfully made? What does it mean for God to have created you in His image? What does it mean for you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works? You know this phrase, workmanship, is from the Greek poema, poem. You are God's work of art created in Christ Jesus for good works. So our youth need to be exposed to some of the biblical foundations of who we are in Christ. Open discussion of very, very sensitive issues that they don't discuss with their family, but very open with each other. And if you are a mentor among them, they'll be open with you if they have earned your trust. Inspire them. Inspire them with a vision of Jesus Christ. I'll never forget this story told to me by uh, Michael Griffiths, former director of the Overseas Missionary Fellowship or former China in the Mission. He was at a conference in Philippines giving a talk and he wrote this book called Give Up Your Small Ambition. So he was, he was in between sections and he was walking by the beach and he saw a Filipino student reading his book Give up your small ambitions. So Michael stopped and said, Oh, in his typical English accent, are you giving up yours? <laughs> I cannot speak like British. Are you giving up yours? You know what that person, the student say? Yes. What are you putting in its place? To build the church of God. A young undergraduate student from Philippines. To build the church of God. Wow, that's amazing. Now, this is a church that I once did some research in in Wellesley, Massachusetts, which is outside Boston, Wellesley. Uh, and I'd like you to look at this series of photos. This is a place where the youth hang out in the church, in a basement. Look at how this room is structured, what are on its walls, uh, and tell me what are they trying to achieve from your understanding of Eric Erickson's stage of identity versus role confusion. Um, so I told you about these uh, crisis situations at every stage. The first year of life, trust versus mistrust. Favorable outcome, unfavorable outcomes. And the resolution is toward hope. Second stage, autonomy was a doubt towards a sense of will. Third, initiative was a skill towards a sense of purpose. Fourth, industry was a inferiority towards competence. And lastly, towards fidelity from identity versus confusion. There are three other stages of Erickson's theory that are important, but uh, you can learn it yourself. Now, some theological reflections. Number one, we are created in the image of God with the capacity to love him and to love one another. It is not surprising that Erickson found that love is so critical for the nurture of the human person and a sense of self. And to be in community, you cannot be alone. God is our triune God. Second, trust. Trust is always emphasized in Scripture. The kingdom belongs to those who have a childlike trust in, in him. 
trusting God for daily provisions for our very lives. As we grow, this trust does not diminish. It in continues. We come to faith. We come to Christ in faith. We continue in faith. It increases. That's very clear in Hebrews. Then, he talks about autonomy and the initiative versus, uh, versus guilt. Autonomy versus shame, initiative versus guilt. And that sense of um, self-sufficiency is so important in Ericsson, but there is also the sense of accountability. And I sense that Ericsson may not have taken into account, and, and that's not his concern because that's not his argument to bring in religion, but yeah, the doctrine of the fall is very important. The sense of self-centeredness that needs to be corrected. Although Erickson, to his credit, did say that as one develops, one has to understand the requirements of the social uh, requirements of the others. Uh, so that's important. So guide children uh, it, when they're young, uh, they might need to be disciplined. It's very, very important. As I said, uh, these are the two uh, persons whom I learned from. Erickson has influenced practical theology more than any other developmental theorist. In fact, uh, Nancy Going says Erickson has influenced youth ministry more than any other theologian. That's why it is so important to understand him. Finally, let me introduce you to this wonderful article by Nancy Going. Nancy Going said, hey, to look at ministry to our teens and preteens from the developmental perspective may be limiting because God may have given teenagers these strong emotions and feelings as a way to drive them to experience the deeper love of God. So she said, how about adolescent development as a way of forming Christ in them? Wow, I love it. The challenges that teenagers face, could it be times when they cry out to God? Times that God has brought as part of their life so that they can go to know Him even more. And the implications of this are, if you're ministering with youth, let them tell their stories. Affirm some of the pain, the struggles. Bring them back to Scripture. Tell them that God is doing some work in you. It's part of shaping and forming you. That is so important. We end here.